the Cannabis Heals Me podcast, episode 92. You're listening to the Cannabis Heals Me podcast, where we explore the real stories of real people who have discovered the profound healing properties of the cannabis plant in their own lives. Find more at CannabisHealsMe.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cannabis Heals Me podcast. This is your host, Rachel Kennerly, recording once again from the Storybook Inn Studios. Thank you so much to everyone who is joining us today. If you are new to the show, we're here. Glad you made it. We'd love to hear how you heard about the show. Send us an email, podcast at CannabisHealsMe.com, or feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, at CannabisHealsMe, on Instagram, at CannabisHealsMe. Try to keep it pretty consistent, except for over on Facebook, which does not like the word cannabis. And you can find us at facebook.com slash mjhealsme. We would love to hear from you. If you want to follow us out there, we'll give you a follow back. I've been asking you guys for the past several months, well, probably longer than that, but I've been asking you guys for quite some time to go out and give us a rating or review on the podcast catcher of your choice. And the reason we ask you to do that is because it gives us a boost in the algorithms and the show will actually recommend us to other people that listen to similar type programs. And we got a review that came in last week from Bunny. 35 from Canada. So we really appreciate you, Bunny, for leaving us a review. And Bunny's re review said, found this podcast after listening to many other cannabis podcasts. It is very informative to those who want to be informed on the subject and its many uses. So thank you, Bunny, for that review. We really appreciate it. It's going to help us out. And if you are so inclined, we'd really appreciate it if you, the listener who has not done so, go out and give us a rating or review on the podcast app of your choice. We'd also really appreciate it if you go out and sign up for our email newsletter list. You can go out to CannabisHealsMe.com slash subscribe and get signed up for that. We send out an email once or twice a month, but the reason we ask you to sign up for that email newsletter list is because all the social media platforms can sometimes depress us or shadow ban us. So if we need to get information out to you in a hurry, the email newsletter list is a perfect way to get directly into your inbox without having to worry about Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram filtering us out. So go out, sign up for that, and you'll actually get a free PDF copy of Ron Paul's 1988 campaign booklet called The Case for Le Drug the Case for Drug Legalization. That's a free gift to everyone who signs up for our email newsletter list. You'll find some great information in there, some great arguments in there to come back against. You'll have you'll find some great ammunition in that PDF. In you'll find some great ammunition in that PDF to come up against some of the normal arguments that you're going to hear from people when you talk about legalizing drugs. So CannabisHealsMe.com slash subscribe, and you get can get signed up for that email newsletter list. Our guest today is Monica Perez. Monica is the host of the Monica Perez Show, which airs each weekend on WSB in Atlanta, 95.5. You can also listen on iHeartRadio.com during showtimes, usually on Saturdays from 3 to 6 Eastern Time. Monica is also the co-host of a podcast called The Propaganda Report. She and Brad Binkley take a deep dive into current events and focus on how the mainstream media often uses our emotions to shape opinions. I invited Monica on to talk about a documentary called AKA Tommy Chong. We'll discuss the movie briefly and then just kind of move out from there and talk about how the federal government is more than happy to use the power of the purse to persecute people who have an opinion that is contrary to the view that they think that people should have. Monica, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to talk to you. I've heard you on several other podcasts, Pete Quinones' show, and then also I heard you recently on with Mark Clare of Lions of Liberty. On these Thursday shows, I like to get people to come on and talk about stuff. And I'll find people that, that are interesting to me. And I'm like, okay, how can I tie this back into cannabis? Yeah. <laughs> so I put in Monica Perez and cannabis and boom, <laughs> a review for a, uh, for a movie on Tommy Chong, AKA Tommy Chong came up and I'm like, oh, there's my end. There's my way to talk to her. Perfect. And I loved that. I found that documentary fascinating. I've referred to it numerous times because of all the lessons to be learned from it. And uh, I just, I love it. So, cause it doesn't only affect 
cannabis, but just how our legal system can be perverted for political purposes. Yeah, and I had actually never seen it before. I, I've really only been as far as like, you know, pro cannabis, probably like the past three years. So I'm a relatively new convert to feeling that people should have the ability to put in their body what they choose to put in their body. So I'd never seen it because it happened, you know, before my time. I was watching it and I was just like astounded. I, I guess before we get into too much conversation, if you want to give the listeners just a brief summary of what it's about, if like me, they lived under a bush and don't know what this is all about. Yeah, the Tommy Chong story was so interesting to me as well, because he, of course, is the half of Cheech and Chong, the movie that that they talk about, like the government has said, glamorizes pot use. But it's funny because one of the lawyers in the movie actually says, like, this doesn't glamorize pot use. It's actually these guys are dopes, dopey dopers, you know, like they, they don't they're not. It's all in good fun. I don't care. I'm just saying, like, it's not glamorizing anything. It's just but it makes the cops look as stupid as the users. So Whatever, it's just comedy. So and that's what all comedy does. I mean, when yes. you watch a comedy and it's like the cops are smart or anybody really in the comedy is smart. And as things get more PC and things are less, more things are untouchable, humor just goes away and they get mad at you for laughing at anything. And it's like, well, when you can laugh at things, you can understand them a little bit better. And it does uh, develop nuances and helps us understand each other and our own weaknesses and all that stuff. It's important. And there's to punish it is like definitely taking yourself too seriously, which that crowd for sure does that it's the <laughs> department of justice. And they, so, so Tommy Chong has adult children and one of them wanted to start a, a bong making company. I guess he wanted to play off his dad's career and, and, but they were artisanal works of art. They were glass bongs that people probably didn't even smoke out of mostly. And they, he brought a lot of work to artisans and all that. And they were, because of Tommy Chong's like, money and position, he was very scrupulous about obeying the laws. He had lawyers. They were, they knew what they were allowed to do, what they were not allowed to do. And there's a, in the gut, the federal government started a couple of operations. I think it was called operation headhunter operation pipe dreams I think that's the same thing in the end they merged. But the idea was to go after people who sold drug paraphernalia because states weren't doing it. So states weren't doing it. And I'm a big advocate of the 10th Amendment. I don't even think the Department of Justice should exist, actually. The 10th Amendment includes all like police powers, everything. So you're there. The states are supposed to do it. And by overruling the states, you really rob the states of sovereignty, which people on the right, especially realize that if you've got a problem with the president like Trump, you know, the, the answer isn't globalism or revolution or whatever. It's restore the 10th Amendment. And these guys violate it on the right, even though they say that they they defend the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Right. No, I get it. I've, I've had those arguments with quite a few people. It's like, well, if you if you claim to follow the Constitution, then you should follow the Constitution all the way. Just not pick and choose the parts that you like that agree with your personal yeah. philosophy in life. Right. And I'm a libertarian and I, I believe in, I like the bill of rights. I'm an anarcho-capitalist, but I respect <laughs> and appreciate the bill of rights as a way to live in this unfree society. At least you have some protections. And that's what this story really highlights is how that the bill of rights is, ero is being eroded in a couple of different ways. So the kid wanted to start this bong company and he did, and he knew there was one kind of obscure law or a recent ruling or something that made him shipping to Pennsylvania. Not okay. So somebody called from Pennsylvania and asked for a huge shipment and he wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. Finally, the guy comes into, this is my understanding of the story. I watched the movie twice. I read about it, but you know, maybe, maybe there are details that were misrepresented. I don't know. But anyway, the guy actually walks in and places the order in person and may or may not have even paid for it in advance. Then when it was, they were all finished, which took up a lot of the time of that organization to get it done and took up a lot of room in their, in their storage, in their warehouse, their workhouse. They, the, the guy said, Oh, I'm back in Pennsylvania. I need you to ship it to me. It's like, absolutely not. No, 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 no. And then ultimately they relented and that's when they got busted. So by any normal reading of this, that was, I, I would call it entrapment. I mean, it's not my field of expertise, but I went to law school and I, I think that's entrapment. And I always, I try to compare it 
with the John DeLorean case where he was entrapped and he fought it in court and he won. Now it ruined his life. It's not like it's not going to ruin its life, his life, but it, that was back in the day when you could actually fight stuff like that. And now uh, they, when you see how plea bargains operate, they, and, and this AKA Tommy Chong the documentary really opened my eyes to this where Tommy Chong didn't actually do anything. He wasn't a participant. It was his son made that decision and they didn't charge his son. His wife had nothing to do with it. They threatened, they told Tommy Chong that he, they would go after his wife and son. I believe sentences of like 99 years were thrown around. Wow. I think. And, and so Tommy Chong wasn't even really accused of doing anything wrong. But he knew that even if there was a one in a hundred chance that one that a son or a wife would go to jail, they'd be going to jail for a year each, you know, and and but even worse than that, it's they escalate. That's why I'm really cautious, really concerned about these laws from terrorism to like what's happening to Lori Lachlan, which is a whole nother story. But they when you don't plea bargain, they they escalate the crime. And then if you do federal crimes, state crimes, if you have one single act, they can charge you with a whole bunch of different crimes and make even suggest that the sentences are serial instead of consecutive or uh, consecutive instead of simultaneous. So he just was in a position, it seemed to me, where where he just could not take that chance, even though he was completely sure that they were in the right and trapped or whatever. And and you can even go further to say that that maybe you can't trust the judge and juries are the more vulnerable you are to this stuff. So, you know, they're not going to they go after Martin Shkreli, who was like the biotech guy or Leona Helmsley or Martha Stewart, like people who are jerks. But really, ultimately, it comes from you mouthing off in a way that does not respect them, which is what Tommy Chong seemed to have been guilty of. And they even had the audacity of writing it into the court papers that he made light of law enforcement efforts in the drug war. Now, this is this is in pursuit of Operation Pipe Dreams, which was simply about incarcerating people and their pieces of glass. So it's it is it is you should take that lightly, like you should take lightly what they're trying to do, because it's light. It's stupid. (laughs) You know, it's a piece of glass. I think I read that they spent like 12 million bucks. Uh, Putting this operation together, 2000 law enforcement agents, they arrested 55 people or shut down 55 entities. And Tommy Chung got the longest sentence, was treated the harsh, most harsh, even though he was never arrested before. But that just goes to show you how minor it all was. If Tommy Chung and his nine months in federal prison was the worst they could do and was considered an egregious thing to do. What was the point of that 12 million dollars in 2000? You know, when they're talking about. Well, the, the murder rate, just take real crime. They These kind of things take away from enforcing real crime, you know, to preventing real crimes against innocent people. Hey, guys, wanted to tell you real quick about our podcast host and sponsor, Anchor.fm. If you're thinking about starting your own podcast, I highly recommend Anchor. It's free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go out to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm. Now back to the show. Literally, like there's that, that's a clear example. Yeah, and in his retelling of what happened, there was like a helicopter that landed at his house or was flying over his house and like 20 feds and 10 cops came busting in his door early in the morning. And then all these officers raided the warehouse where his son made the bongs. I mean, it was incredible the amount of of human resources that they used for this. And then to find out that they spent 12 million bucks on it and they had to entrap them in order to even get this conviction. I wonder if at some level, actually, I never saw any suggestion of it, but it just reminds me of another case that happened in California. I wish I had thought of this sooner. I would have looked it up. Maybe you know about it. It was a guy they wanted, I think it was California. They wanted his land, like the government wanted his land for something. And it was a lot of land. And by, as luck would have it, even though he wouldn't sell, wouldn't sell, wouldn't sell, and they couldn't get the eminent domain thing, somehow some helicopter spotted this little 
uh, cops of whatever, like little plot of pot plants. And they, I think they came into his house oh, with wow. pot pouches. They might even have killed him. Oh, wow. You know, in the raid. I, I can't, I'm surprised. The fact that you don't know about that makes me wonder if I've got my well, details again, right. that's probably before my time, so... Right. But but the point is that asset forfeiture. Yes. Let's just take that example out of it. Let's just say asset forfeiture sets up these what appear to be bizarre misallocation of resources, perverse incentives where they're putting a bunch of stuff in there because there are there are advantages and incentives set up for law enforcement, which is really like an unethical kind of practice. Yeah, we talked about that with Michael Bolden a few episodes back. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Folks want to check that out if they haven't. And speaking of civil asset forfeiture, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't try to go after more of Tommy's assets in this because he is a high profile character. And he had a pound of pot there. Right. Well, I guess he had a medical card for it, didn't he, though? Oh, did he? I think he said that, but I don't don't remember. That's that's quantity, though. I mean, I don't know. They they are laughing. The, the wife was saying, like, it's not quantity if you're a pot smoker. You have a pound of sugar, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I thought that I was think hilarious. That goes, yeah, she was good. Um, that goes to a point, actually, that what I found about him is that kind of thing can backfire. So now he's a guy who is on the inside and maybe... I don't see him as being much of an activist right now. I haven't really followed what he's been up to since then. And he was kind of, he didn't look that old, but like, I don't know. Once you start being in your sixties and stuff, I think you might start burning out. Like I wouldn't want to start a new cause and he's done his time literally, but, but it can empower you or at least change ideas about justice. And if they had taken his stuff, he really would have had to fight that to the nail. And uh, and in a civil case, you probably could have. So, like, you know, you, they're not going to take you to jail for it. You could put all your resources behind it. And I just feel like that high pro, they, they do it to people who have no resources, have no voice. And that asset forfeiture is crazy because they, you don't have to have a conviction. No, they just basically have to accuse your property of crime, and then you have to go in and prove that it's innocent of the crime, which is completely backwards from the way our justice system is supposed to work. And property, as any good libertarian would know, is an extension of yourself. I mean, that's your lifeblood. That represents hours of your life. Thing is, So is like the ability to imbibe cannabis. It's just a part of yourself. And, And here's the thing, like Bloomberg wanted to ban sugary drinks way back in the day. And he said, of course, this is why I don't think they're really left-leaning libertarians because it immediately contradicts itself. He said, now that we have social medicine, Obamacare, we get to tell you what you can do with your own body. And that, so that's where that conflicts immediately. But he was then, when you take sugary drinks away, then you're telling people that substituting with NutraSweet, for example, is a good thing to do. And the FDA, from what I read, it was a while ago, but at that time I investigated it, and I think the FDA gets 95% of its complaints are about NutraSweet, I, something like that. Like it just oh, gives wow. people headaches. There's something a little bit wrong with it or a lot wrong. I don't know, but but the, it's not a good thing. So when you take away the resources that people have of, of medicating themselves or treating themselves good or bad, doesn't matter, then you're you know, they just have no, you have no right to do that to other people. And then to take the resources away from the legitimate function of government, which is to make sure other people don't do stuff to your body that you object to, that is the sole reason government exists, that we have delegated its right. Our, we have shared with them, not even delegated, but shared with them our right to self-defense. That's it. That's the only thing that we all agree on. And they they divert those resources in order to tell you what you can't can and can't do with your with your own body. But then then they extend it to the property so that they can they can get the benefits of that. I mean, that's just that's just pure uh, complete corruption yes. of even even like a true believer's argument of what government is justifies. Well, and I think most people because I didn't know that civil asset. I always thought, oh, that's kind of cool that they take all these uh, bad people's things and they sell them and they can use that to fund their department. But I I think most people don't realize that in civil asset forfeiture, merely their property just has to be accused of a crime. These people haven't actually been been convicted of committing a crime. 
So when I realized that, I'm like, holy moly, that's just wrong. And I think most people have that gut reaction when you explain to them what civil asset forfeiture is. Yeah, it's amazing that it can exist and that it has that it's given incentives cross border. I believe the Fed does the federal government not give might might even give local incentives to that kind of stuff. Yeah, they give them kickbacks because what will yeah. happen is like the states will ban it, basically say, hey, you can't use civil asset forfeiture. Right. So the locals will kick it up to the feds and then the feds will kick back money to them. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff that completely, you know, robs us of any kind of state sovereignty, anything like that. They just go around the back door on so many on so many issues like that. And you can see it. There are just a lot of different laws where. I don't know what it is like they they said they didn't like that some states had drinking ages below 21. So they they tied highway funding. Oh, yeah. To wow. Drinking ages. And then I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to let your highway get all messed up. But yes, probably. That would be fine. It'd be good for your local farmers and stuff. <laughs> but you know, but you just can't think like that. Right. Like they're bribing you and you're going to take it. Yeah. He heaven forbid you bring up even the concept of private roads. I mean, that's just a no no, uh, no, can't I know, do. but, <laughs> but the fact is like they, the way it used to be, the private roads were built by people who like had, you know, maybe in today's language, like housing development or stores or factories, they'd have to build the roads to get the people back and forth and they would. And now, now with like small batch factories and everything, you could have a very local community. You don't really need those roads. And, uh, but that's the kind of stuff where you think you're getting something for nothing, but there it's just to control the local laws. Well, going back to the movie, one of the things that surprised me, or I guess um, made me think a little bit, is is Tommy kind of thought, I think at first he kind of was not really that worried about it because he thought, well, I've got these resources. I'm a well-known person. This isn't going to stick. This is entrapment. And he kind of finally came to the realization, well, man, if they can get me, they can pretty much get anybody. Yeah. And that's why I look at the cases of famous people where, like I was saying, Lori Loughlin and, and this Shkreli is that these are got people who are painted in the press as having done these terrible things. If you look into their cases, you realize that they, that in, in my opinion, but the, you know, the Shkreli thing, he was the guy who like mouthed off about being able to charge a bunch of a really exorbitant price for bio, for uh, pharmaceutical stuff. But he, Oh yeah. 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 That guy? The, um, the, was it the, ins oh, I know was what it, you're it, talking about, like insulin yeah. or something like Maybe. that. Maybe I, so I forget which the drug was, but he was a young upstart guy. He was very mouthy. He was absolutely convinced that he had first amendment rights, which he now knows that he did not. <laughs> he was a hedge fund manager and he seemed like a prodigy if you ask me. And, and they got him on like, he, they got him on some counts and not on others, which was an indication that the jury was just confused about the whole thing. But the underlying crime supposedly was that he screwed over the investors. But but the investors were making good returns and they only started losing money when this guy was removed from the helm and put in jail. So he maybe he did some things wrong. Maybe he didn't. But he was there because he was a wise guy. And um you know, I don't know about Lori Lachlan. It could be her politics, her religion. I think she was on the right. I, I think she was totally innocent and entrapped by the uh, and uh, conned out of a bunch of money. Lori Lachlan was the college scandal. Uh, other people did stuff wrong. Yeah, but. Yeah. My thing on the Lori Lachlan thing, it's like, look, she didn't hurt me. Why are we spending all this money to put her in a cage right. over it? It was a private institution who could sue her for right. tort, I suppose. But I don't. But I think if you read the FBI affidavit... It doesn't say like, I think she was being conned by this guy and she gave $500,000 to his tra ca charity in good faith. Like, I think she really, but I think that her politics were no good. And I think they do it is like Guantanamo. Like who doesn't want a terrorist locked away? You know, but right. I think, and they're like, they're not even American and this is a war and blah, blah, blah. And I, yeah, I get that. Like, I don't, but and I was never big into that issue. That was a complete like Democrat issue during the Bush era. 
I actually now think that they're in jail down there without trial because they're not really there for being suspected of a crime, but maybe they're for like knowing stuff. I don't know. But you can see that it's a slippery slope. Right. And I think some of those guys in Guantanamo, it's like, Maybe their names are the same as somebody who was actually yes, a criminal. Yes, I used to be and now it's- on planes all the time because I guess Monica Perez is like a pretty common name crossing the border. <laughs> but, but there was a woman. Oh, actually, Attorney General Barr just came out with this stuff where he's using the terrorist stuff, like all the experience we've had with terrorists and applying them to mass shooters or people who are suspected of ambiguous intent is one of the words that came out of it. But it's very clear that this stuff is a slippery slope against where they, people are getting used to, uh, uh, having their rights suspended for certain reasons. So when I said something about Lori Lachlan, I got a tweet back. I tweeted something about her. I got a tweet back from, you know, a, it seemed like a normal person, not a troll saying, she, they should throw the book at her. They should escalate the amount of prison time she's facing. I think it's up to 40 years now because, yeah, wow. because, and her daughter just put a video out. She has 2 million subscribers. They did not have to bribe USC, which is a film school for somebody who's cutting edge on like the new media, I think. But anyway. And she doesn't even need to go to college. That's the I mean, thing. I think she's back. I heard her say she doesn't even care about going to college. Yeah, it's and they they would have been lucky to have her, and I'm sure they know that. And and the dad was friends with the head of the athletic department, and the con artist told him not to talk to the guy. Like it was so weird. Yeah, really, really oh, weird. Wow. Just real con stuff. So, mm-hmm. but in any case, so somebody tweeted at me in response to the thing I said that she people like her deserve to face that kind of escalating sentencing because they're wasting the taxpayer's money on a trial. Wow. Like wrap your mind around that. Like, you know, and that's probably a person who thinks she believes in the constitution and the bill of rights. And the the federal government feels the same way too. If you are going to make us take you to trial, we're going to up the ante and make the make the consequences so much worse. I mean, I guess we've kind of some of the people like that have kind of been brainwashed into thinking the same way the federal government does. Where if if you challenge us, then yes. you're going to pay. But here's the thing that I don't understand and this is why I this is what disappoints me about Trump. This is I mean not that I had expectations of him. I'm not disappointed in him. <laughs> but what saddens me about the Trump movement that is that I saw So maybe you're, I don't know if you're new to this game as well, but I followed Ron Paul for years. My father used to contribute to his congressional campaigns like 40 years ago. Oh, wow. He loved him because he was a libertarian. And so I've been watching Ron Paul over the years. And in 2008, he ran to 2012, he ran and was really getting traction. I mean, college kids were burning dollars. It was like the craziest thing. And I think they knew they had a problem and they knew they had this energy, this, this grassroots energy, and they had to do something with it. So the mainstream media totally ignored Ron Paul, but they built up Trump as tapping into that same emotional place, but not with any of the ideology to back it up at all. So then you have this situation where people are, are just not, they don't have that touchstone anymore. And it becomes this kind of personality issue where they forget to really look at what is the, what are these fundamentals? And the fundamental is the reason the Bill of Rights exists. It's not, it doesn't, the reason it doesn't say you have the right to smoke pot in the Bill of Rights is the Bill of Rights is there entirely to restrain government. The government that they just created, it's entirely there just to restrain government because that is the foundation of this country is extreme skepticism about Mm -hmm. concentrated power. And I don't know if the founders felt that way or if that's just how they had to sell it to us. But the deal we struck is that we don't trust you and therefore we need to be protected. So when you have people saying, I know that Lori Loughlin's guilty because the government told me so. And, and we don't even have to go through the process of proving it. I mean, that's when the battle is lost. And, and mm-hmm. it will be one of those situations where there's nobody left to defend it. 
And I think that's the impression that a lot of people get. Well, if you're accused of the crime, they automatically assume that you're guilty. You know, so it is almost like you are guilty until proven innocent, which is the flip of what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to go in there on a jury and say this person's innocent and their job is to prove that they're guilty. Whereas now we put the, I think a lot of people put that that onus on the defendant is they have to prove they didn't do this. And the crime has to be a crime too. Yes. There's no basis for a crime of making bongs. But even if there were a, a, like an ideological basis for it, which I would say there is not, Tommy Chong was there because of his, because he was getting away with influencing people against the narrative. And maybe you could take it one step further and say, cause he was a pot smoker, but they didn't get him on smoking pot. You right. know, they got him on it on something else. And it was really cause he was an influencer. It was not controlled. Yeah. The crazy thing to me is that like they did this not back in the seventies, whenever he was at the peak of his influence, they did it. What, when was it? They did it. It was shortly after nine 11. It was within okay. a few years of that. And, and the one thing that I didn't like about the documentary or the criticism I had, the only one really was that they did talk a lot about Republicans and Ashcroft and Bush. And I knew right away that was a problem, that you can't think of it that way because it's not, it is not a Republican Democrat. There are no heroes up there. They aren't. And if right. you if you think that, you're just gonna keep batting this ball back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You have somebody like Obama come in and give people more hope, and then he engages in the same stuff. Even regarding this particular thing, from everything from 9-11 to drugs to immigration, he had similar overarching policies, Syria, Ukraine, it was all the same. And you just get deluded. And that's why hating Trump is as dangerous as liking him. Having strong feelings one way or the other. I mean, he's not founded in principle, but I'll give the guy his due when he makes good choices. You know, this uh, uh, the jail reform stuff is good. The criminal justice reform is good. But his foreign policy, he talks a good game, but when it comes right down to it, he doesn't follow up on it. That's for sure. I also think that there's a lot of devil in the details with that stuff. So, like, he's big against the trade thing. He got us out of TPP. But this USMCA, this this new NAFTA, is a very dangerous piece of legislation uh, or treaty or whatever you want to call it that can actually have an impact on our legislation, our employment law, our environmental law. So yeah, it might even have an implication for what you're, for what you uh, champion in herb rights, because it, I mean, you don't know. And then I, I believe it goes like kind of autonomous so that it doesn't even need to answer to our legislators anymore. It's a scary thing. So yeah, I, I mean, it's bad enough that we've ceded so much of our power to the federal government and then to think yes. that our federal government is going to cede it to yes. someone else. Yes, it's really scary. That's so pretty terrifying. I do I do support when, when the principles that he advocates are good. I do also say that with all policy, you just... And this is why, I mean, it's hard for me as a libertarian to really get into the nitty-gritty of federal policy because I would say 99.9% .9 of it is unconstitutional. All administrative law is unconstitutional. Anything that has to do with health, welfare, policing, education, all of that is unconstitutional according to the 10th Amendment. So there's almost nothing left <laughs> that that is even worthy of like identifying. But uh, but the details and the policies sometimes don't even support what they're saying they support. So, you, you know, whether it's immigration or foreign policy or whatever, like sometimes it's just the opposite anyway. Sorry, I hope that's not too down. There's a lot of great things in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I guess there's a light at the end of the, the legalization tunnel for a lot of states. But, you know, my, my concern with that is that, you know, a lot of them, they're seeing it as a cash grab. It's not, they're legalizing cannabis because they, it should have never been illegal to begin with. Right. And my father used to make me call it decriminalizing. And my father fought in World War II. It's not like he was like super, he was a hippie. He was just like, it's decriminalizing because they criminalized it. Exactly. exactly. And that's the way, I mean, that's the way it ought to be. They should just decriminalize it. That's it. We're done. Yes, we I totally Peace agree. Out. And I remember when the first domino fell, Colorado, I did a show and I said, they're all going to fall now because it was like Uber. 
once it broke through whatever political barrier there was, it was going to break through. And then you were going to see that it's just going to get converted to a tool of the government. And then I looked into it and way back then, yes. George Soros was funding that effort in Colorado, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was George Soros funding. Really? And I thought, no, That's I went back interesting. To a conspiracy book, a classic, conspiracy classic uh, by John, what the heck, Dr. John Coleman. It was called The Committee of 300. And in it, he talks about, this was from the 90s, he talks about how some things that sounded so crazy. It was like they want to legalize drugs because they want to dumb down the population and control people and uh, all that. And then I, I saw that Soros was into it and I was like, oh, maybe they do. You know, maybe they want to neutralize young people. <laughs> and uh, But I always worry whenever they say like, oh, regulate it and tax it. I'm like, no, no, no. The taxing, uh, I think it was in that book, Drug what, what was it? What was that very famous? It was like the first big one. It was like drug war facts. No, maybe it was drug war facts. Uh, it was a really well-known one. I'm absolutely certain. I mean, it's probably on your shelf right now, but it wasn't drug war facts, but it was really a famous one. And they talked about how the, you could see how like, um, was it opium abuse or whatever, as it, in the history of the world and in different countries, how closely correlated the abuse problems were with policy, with government action. So on the one hand, like China, it was, it was thrust upon them, like a, an outside political force wanted people to be addicted to opium so we could trade it for tea or something. I can't remember, but it wasn't us, it was England. But the one that stuck to my mind in my mind was I think in, in the history of Iran or Persia, they had like the the highest rate of of hard drug addiction ever was there, I think, at 18 percent of the population. And it was, if I recall correctly, a result of wanting to that that's where the tax revenue was coming from. They were really poor and they they encouraged people would they knew like with cigarettes and stuff, the elasticity is quite a high with the price of something that you're addicted to. So you would beg, borrow, or steal to get the money, and they can mm -hmm. really tax it highly because the threshold of you actually quitting to avoid paying those taxes is really, really high. So whenever I hear taxes, I'm like, no, you don't want the government to have an incentive to influence your behavior to higher than what you think is where you want to be. Like if the, if the point is this is a gift God gave us to use for our own good or pleasure— then what you don't, you don't need to interfere with, with your judgment making, uh, on that. So if they want to then advertise it as opposed to alcohol, yeah. right? Like Bloomberg was saying about the sugary drinks, do NutraSweet instead, if they're like, do pot instead of alcohol, well, maybe that will change the marginal person from doing what they, what made sense for them. Not that I don't think, I think that is probably generally good trade off, but pot for alcohol. Anyway, but I'm just saying you don't want to get them involved in that. And the regulation, in my mind, will have a counterproductive effect because it, it can do things like have require herbicides and pesticides and stuff in the growing up. Like it can require things that you would never require in your in your window pot. One of the arguments that we make as libertarians is like, OK, if they just decriminalize this, then it eliminates the black market. So now the argument that we're getting back is like, well, look at all these states that have legalized, like California and Colorado. They still, especially in California, they still have a vibrant black market because the taxes on this stuff is like 40 percent. And who knows what's regulated in or out? Like if you if you want. Personally, I think it's probably if you just wanted to have stuff that looks like it grew out of the ground, it's probably kind of harder to come by that. You know, they've in California, I know they do gummies. And I try to tell my kids, like, if you can't tell what it looked like coming out of the ground, you probably don't want to put it in your face. Like, I don't just don't put it in your face, whatever it is. You have to be able to identify. Otherwise, it's probably been exposed to a level of processing that's just not good for you. So I don't know how it how the regulation affects mm -hmm. the trade in those places. But, yeah, it, they have big black market problems in other countries for stuff like jewelry. Big, big problems. Yeah, because they because they're so hyper taxed and people want gold because they they consider it a store of value. 
So there's always reasons, but they are big problems elsewhere. You can tell the black market isn't itself a problem. Yeah. So, I mean, until they quit taxing the heck out of it, they're still going to have. Oh, I bet cigarettes. Cigarettes must have a huge black market in New York. New York, where it's like 11, 12 bucks a pack, I think, last time. Oh, wow. There. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, unless it went down from where it was, but that ain't going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I, I don't smoke cigarettes anymore, but when I started smoking, I'm really going to date myself. I think it was like 85 cents a pack or $1. fifty something like that. And now, I mean, I would, ne- that's just crazy, 50 cents a cigarette or whatever. But I'm guessing that there's a black market for it, at least just coming from other states. Well, Eric Garner was part of the black market. Oh, yeah, right. Of course, right. And here's the thing. So you can look at that and say, as a libertarian, like he was doing the right thing, but think about the poor sucker in the store behind him that was attracting all the cigarette buyers and paying all the taxes and paying the licensing fees and delegating all his power to the cops outside. And then they have somebody who wants to engage in a free market. And that guy is taking away business from somebody who accepts you know, the reality of a highly regulated world backed by force and violence which is what it is. Yeah, that's what I think a lot of people that they just don't get that that all these laws and regulations are enforced by force. You know, they think, well, we'll just make these regulations and people will just follow them. It's like, well, but the ones that don't follow them, the logical conclusion is they wind up in a cage or they wind up dead. Yes, and that's the way it has to be. There's no other way because as soon as You stop that, people are just going to do what they want. As soon as they know right away, it's like you take red light cameras down and the, and they, people start running the lights again, you put them up and they go away. So I think we know that, that it's, it's really just a question of they can, they can hurt you, put you in jail or take your money, which is the, the killing and the stealing that we kind of think that they're there to diminish. But I might go too deep for you, Rachel, but if you ever read our enemy, the state by Albert J. Nock. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good and short. You could probably get the PDF 80 pages. I wrote a review of that too, but it was so great. (laughs) And the guy, I bet I can find it out on Mises.org. Yes. Yes. They have a lot of free resources out there. Yes. I am confident that they, they have that one. And he just was talking about how the, the, how government is one thing, like having an organization and structure and laws and everything is one thing, formal or informal, but the state exists solely to, to transfer the benefit of, of you, your rights to somebody else. So like he defines how the political means versus the economic means. So the economic means is when you're actually producing value and then you create wealth, but the political means of what, of gaining wealth is not to produce the value, but to steal it through credit or force or whatever, you know, getting credit for something you didn't do. But, but that's just the de- definition of politics really. And I, and I just see it now what they, what I've seen called a pathocracy. It's just, they're using their power to, to violate our rights instead of protecting them. One of the, the, and I'm not a a very emotional, sappy person, or I don't feel like I am. One of the saddest things to me about when I was watching this movie was, was, was when he was getting ready to leave. I don't know if I cried, but I almost cried. It was just sad watching him, uh, you know, knowing he's fixing to leave and go live in a cage for nine months. And I can't even fathom being, and it was a federal pen, and and I've been, I have, I have visited a federal I was penitentiary. Say, I wasn't, wow, do tell, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't actually a resident there, but I did. A, a friend of mine ended up getting in trouble for tax stuff, and I went, uh, took his mother to see him, and you know, as far as jails go, it's not too bad there. But it's still jail. You're still in a cage. You can't leave or go. And he do, had a but... nice life. He used to go. The last thing he did, I think, was go do dance tango with his wife because that's what they used to do on the weekend. The guy was just the most harmless person you could possibly. And the and the bongs were beautiful. Like it, it's just messed up, and there's no reason for it. And they and then the the worst part about the whole thing, to m- my opinion, was that John Ashcroft press conference. I mean, you wanted to cry yes. when this guy was going to jail. I wanted to barf when John Ashcroft was yes. was was patting that chick on the back, and you did such a great job. I mean, if you it, it, was it belonged in a Cheech and Chong movie, 
You know, they, <laughs> they were exactly what Cheech and Chong was making fun of. Like, are you kidding? This is what makes you feel good. This is, you're the head, you're the top law enforcement officer of the country. And you are taking the time to tell her that she did a good thing in breaking that piece of art. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, you spent twelve million dollars and you got one conviction for nine months. Yes. You yeah. really took a hardened criminal off the street there, like a drug right. kingpin for sure. And of course, if if you were really after promoting the drug war, the last thing you want to do is like get that story get out. I mean, that absolutely made you think like this is just ridiculous. Not to mention, I, I bet you know the stats, but. I can only imagine the comparative statistics of the damage caused by alcohol abuse versus marijuana abuse. You never call it marijuana anymore. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. And I you know. know, you know, it was Mary Jane first, right? And then they changed it to marijuana so it would sound Mexican. <laughs> so it even gets yeah. even worse than that. Right. No, I, I try to avoid marijuana because of the, the racist undertones of it. It's like, Oh, it's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's know. the thing. I didn't realize it was until I found out that they actually, it was intentional. Yeah. It was just called Mary Jane. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm going to call it what it, the, you know, the, the Latin word for it and uh, leave it there. And, and the, the crazy thing is, is living in East Texas. When I say cannabis, people don't know what I'm talking about. Really? Yeah. Well, that's the thing about, I lived in Texas for a long time, for years and years, uh -huh. and uh, I could never understand why people who would advocate, advocate so strongly for gun rights, God-given right to a gun, would not advocate for drug rights when drugs, cannabis anyway, is, is absolutely in the form that God gave it to you. You know what I mean? Like the closest thing to self-defense yeah. that you've got is like your fingernails in the form that God gave it to you. You know, I get, I am a strong advocate of gun rights. Absolute, absolute gun rights around the world. But I, but I just don't understand that. I just remember that about Texas is that, or, and I heard somebody say, somebody from Ohio say he thought he found that Support for gun rights was in any individual was in, in his experience or society inversely correlated with support for drug rights. Well, I would agree with that. And the crazy thing is, is like all, all my friends here back when Bloomberg was proposing this soda tax or outlawing sodas or whatever it was, they were all up in arms. Yes. Over that. But then you try to, you try to correlate that. Well, if people have a choice to put sugar in your body, which we're now finding out more and more, it's really awful for you. Right. Well, shouldn't they also have the choice to put cannabis or heroin or whatever mushrooms, whatever they want, you know, as long as they're in the privacy of their own home, but to try and make that argument to people because they, they've totally bought the propaganda for 80 years about this plant that, you know, you just trying to get through there. Their argument is that it's bad for society, which is what right. gun control advocates say about guns, that your rights are not important because of the society's right to be safe. Or, and it's the exact same thing. They're like, those guys steal from me. I'm like, but they wouldn't if there was no black market. I mean, that's where it really gets crazy is that there's no logic to it at all. Yeah, I read some, the book that kind of brought it home for me as far as the drug war goes is uh, Johan Hari's Chasing the Scream. Uh, really good book. He did all this research on it, uh, on just on drugs, not sp specifically cannabis, but just drugs in general, and how society kind of functioned when you could go down to the pharmacy and get, you know, heroin or, you know, cannabis from your local pharmacist. Versus how the world has worked now that we have prohibition. And it's crazy, the the difference. And then in these countries where it's legalized, you know, it's th their society has not descended into the chaos that has been promised us. I saw it on a shelf in Switzerland many <laughs> years ago. I was visiting a friend. So it was after law school, but, be you know, before I had kids. So however long ago that was. And, uh, and he just picked it up off the shelf and bought it. And, and a very, the, I, I might argue the most extreme detriment from the drug war is that, that cannabis went from something that just 
grew out of the ground, not that potent. You could easily control it. You could grow up with it. You could understand what it was about really firsthand to something highly concentrated in a form you can't recognize, you can't look at for dosage. I mean, even when it grows out of the ground, you can kind of look at it and <laughs> see, you know, but but when it, it gets so highly refined like that so that you can put it in your pocket or mask it or transport it in quantity, that's when it can become a dangerous thing. Like they do, that THC vaping thing, I, I went to, this is going to sound like I'm a, like a, active drug user, which I mean, <laughs> my drug is alcohol. I have a cocktail blog. Like it's pretty clear what my drug is. So, but I went to fair thee well, which was the 50th anniversary of the grateful dead mm -hmm. in, um, I mean, obviously no Jerry, but it was in Chicago a couple of years ago and two people, uh, one person I knew. So one of the people, we were in a large group of people, one person ended up in the hospital because this THC vape, vaping was like a new thing and saw other people they knew there. People were going to the hospital because it was so, I mean, in these oh, wow. were people who were not new to cannabis. <laughs> so I'm just yeah. saying, like, I look at that, I'm just like, I tell my kids, like, stay away from that stuff. So it, this is a hundred percent, it's to me, a function of a distorted market, many years of adapting to something that people, and, and this is something that I think applies to immigration, applies to drugs, uh, uh, certainly cannabis. You can't, l l uh, labor laws, people know that they are good moral people and that breaking certain laws does not make them immoral. So if you want to cross the border to work on a farm of somebody you know so that you can feed your kids, you're going to do that. And anybody who tells you that you can't, when you own one piece on one side and they own the other piece on the other side, you can't convince them. The only way you stop them from doing it is to say, I'm going to punish you. I'm forcing you. Same thing with like cannabis. People know it's not inherently wrong. And in order to get people uh, to, to, refrain from it, it has to be through fear and threats of violence and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And in the South, especially we've been trained to see, well, if it's illegal, that means it's immoral. So what I've been trying to do is, is tell people, look, you know, just because it's man's law doesn't mean that it's a moral law. You know, there have been other things that were legal in this country that were wrong. You know, the Rosa Parks sitting on the bus thing just happened recently. And I, I bet that the anti-drug pro-gun mindset is also the anti-abortion mindset. So if you, I mean, my mother is a, is a, an anti, uh, an anti-abortion activist from way back. So I'm, always been very exposed to that argument. And it's, and it is this idea that, that the law and as a libertarian, libertarians can, it's like immigration. It's like competing rights issues that, so like Murray Rothbard would argue that this is your body and you have an absolute right to it. And then an alternative view would be, well, you, you invited that person in or whatever. And you, you know, that person has its own right. So like, I, I get the, the, I always try to go to who has the right, whatever. But it's very clear that the law cannot, isn't going to satisfy everybody's moral belief about that. So for me, I tend to want laws to err on the side of liberty. But they could understand that, that you really, as time goes on, some of these laws get more and more in violation of moral law. And like this USMCA, which might affect environment and labor and all that kind of stuff, it 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 could really impoverish people by not allowing free markets to operate for people to work. And and then you have people on welfare, which I personally do consider to be a morally wrong institution, both for the people who are forced to pay the taxes and for the people who are kind of um, end up in it because there is no free market for labor or that they've come over to this country because their country was blown up by some foreign entity, usually us, you know what I'm saying? Right. So like you, the more many, many laws result in bad moral outcomes. And, and the sooner, like when that chick said that to me about Lori Lachlan, like she should just take her lumps. She's costing me money. And like that Parkland shooting, the kid supposedly went into his high school and shot all those people 
on February 14th, 2018, the day the internet died, by the way. We can talk about that another time. But anyway, he, uh, I remember reading an article there saying, like, some people are questioning whether this guy should get a public defender since his crimes were so egregious. I'm like, he, if you are, you have to prove that the guy did it. You know what I mean? Like, yes, he needs a public defender because you could just accuse him of that and it not really be him. So you just, you know, that kind of thinking when people start to think that the government is always right, it's actually the opposite of the trend. No, I agree with you on that. It's, it seems like the more people think the government is right, the, the wronger it is. Yes. And, it, and, and that's because I think it's so clear how much effort they put into the propaganda. I mean, think about the intensity. It's like you look at like vaccines the intensity and the climate stuff, the intensity with which they are determined that you not think for yourself at all. Don't even do the research. You are a disgusting piece of crap. If you do the research on this, you're just un-American and facts are facts, but truth is truth and be on the right side and all that. And that just demonstrates how the power of the mind is really the most important thing and, and has to be outside of critical thinking or it won't work. My philosophy is if, if the government is willing to lie to us for 80 years over a plant, what what else are they lying to us about? And and when you approach things from that with that in mind, my automatic response where it used to be, oh, I believe, my automatic response now is I'm skeptical. So whatever they're trying to shove down my throat, you know, I'm trying to get it out as quick as they shove it. Well, People label me a conspiracy theorist, which <laughs> I, I mean, whatever, I don't, however, whatever, however you define that, you know, but I tend to do my research before I adopt a narrative that directly contradicts the official narrative. Cause there's a lot of pressure. I'm on terrestrial radio. There's a lot of pressure to accept the official narrative. So if you accept it, you get no pressure at all. But if you don't accept it, people will rebel against you. So I tend to do a little more homework. I'm becoming more and more convinced that this whole facade is there to do just what Albert J. Nock was talking about, that it's really about getting us to allow them to really rob us blind by convincing us constantly that without them, it's like an abusive parent relationship, like without them, you can't only imagine how, but that's why they'll say stuff like on the news, like, well, most people in the world are just animals. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've heard that on Fox News, like they're animals, like they can't, you can't treat them with wow. rights. They're animals. It's like, dude, not to bring religion to it, but this tends to be like on the right, that same idea to, to think that you're Christian and can exclude human beings from the status of human beings, like is at the heart of like colonizing other countries and indigenous people and slavery and, and the, the good Samaritan story. Like it's all about like they, you have to consider people as human beings. And then we've gotten to the point where there's clearly, I believe an apparatus at work in the West that is really meant to, 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 to treat us masses like the climate change thing as like, you know, not worthy of the air we breathe. And that's when you have to start saying, like, you know, Lori Lachlan deserves her day in court. <laughs> she just does. And if she's not getting hers, you're not getting yours. That's right. If somebody with her with her money and her influence can't get a day in court, then what hope do we have as, as ordinary little peons who don't have near the resources that she does? Because, I mean, we would definitely, we're going to be persona non grata for sure. If she can't even get a fair shake and everybody loved her on Full House. <laughs> and yes. Yeah, right. And and the and the laws that pertain to cannabis or uh, other things where y you're not actually a bad person, but you get pigeonholed into, well, MS-13 or whatever it's called, you know, these these gangs, you know, the, every every bud you smoke is going to feed the drug cartel machine and well who are now terrorists by the yes, way yes <laughs> which is going to have serious implications because that means that local oh, I dealers in your town can be can be plea bargained in the face of uh life sentences for selling a, a little whatever god's gift and yeah and now the war on terror is going to be applicable to everybody exactly. in the united states they just have to call them a drug user 
or a drug dealer, and now they're a and terrorist. And they're trying to get domestic terrorism to be a thing, too. All of this stuff is a way to extend, among many other things, extend the suspension of the Bill of Rights that started with Guantanamo, the war on terror, the war on drugs. Both of those things, in my opinion, are solely or primarily there even created or fomented in order to take away our bill of rights, that that's really. So if you look at it the way I look at it, which there is this apparatus at work that is whatever you want to call it, global government or whatever, they, the, the thing that stands between us and them is the bill of rights and all around the world relies on the United States bill of rights as being their touchstone. And they won't let their government get away with stuff too, too far afield. If, and that's why we really, really have to draw the line. And I think the Tenth Amendment, to me, I mean, I love them all. I really do. I really do. I defend them all. But it seems to me that the Tenth Amendment really should be that would that would change a lot if we could just restore the Tenth Amendment. Yeah, if we, if we could get back to that, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. Well, Monica, if folks want to learn more about you or listen to your show or follow more of your crazy conspiracy theories, <laughs> what is... Your conspiracy theories, but they're not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we all say. <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Where, can folks, uh, where can folks find you and find your show? Well, I have a few things working. One is I am on terrestrial radio. So if you want to hear people call and kind of challenge me that way from the mainstream audience, that's always fun. That's the Monica Perez show, which you can catch on WSB out of Atlanta. And you can also see it on iTunes. So just look for Monica Perez. But then I do podcast with my producer from that show. He's my co-host on a daily show, uh, the Drive Time News Blast, which is 30 minutes of news of the day, but from a perspective of truth, liberty, and justice, which I think there's a real, I only did it because I wasn't finding that. Like, no, I think that's huge. I've been saying for years, I wish we had something that would just say, here's the facts. Yes. And lay them out for you without all this spin and all this garbage. So that's awesome. It's so much work that that's why it doesn't exist. So like I'm getting up at like six in the morning to make sure I get the paper right before my my kids get up. But I, but it's been very um, well received. And then we kind of push that through the feed of our deep dive. Every couple of weeks we do a deep dive called the propaganda report. And that's where we talk about like, how do you know there's this worldwide cabal? I'm like, well, because they do a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we we have this video of the Council of Foreign Relations Conference, you know? So, so Brad Binkley, who's my co-host on the Drive Time News Blast, brings the Propaganda Report audio, which is just always triggering me. It's quite amusing. But anyway, you can find all that stuff through the Propaganda Report on any podcast that you like or thepropreport.com. The okay. prop report is probably the easiest one location for it. I know that's a lot of stuff. I have to streamline it, but we oh. were filling different needs and we'll figure it out. There you go. Well, if folks want to follow you on social media and harass you there. Yes, at Monica Perez Show. I'm mostly all about the Twitter, but I also have a forum at thepropreport.com. So like I do, there's a lot of kind of one-on-one stuff there. If you want to post articles or talk to like-minded people and not get trolled, you can just go there and we have a, we have a lot of fun. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll put links to all this in the show notes for today's episode. I encourage everybody to go check out the Monica Perez show and all her various and sundry things that she does. And I appreciate you coming on and talking to me. I, like I said, I'd never even heard of this movie, so I'm glad you did a, a, a review of it so that I could go and watch it and, be more astounded with how corrupt and disgusting our federal government is. Well, thanks very much for having me, Rachel. It's been a lot of fun. Good. Great. Glad to hear it. Thanks, Monica. Show notes for today's episode can be found out at CannabisSealsMe.com slash 92. We will be back here on Monday with another healing story. Until then, you guys have a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode of the Cannabis Heals Me podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider leaving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or whatever podcast app you're using. Do you have a suggestion for a guest on Cannabis Heals Me? Send an email to podcast at CannabisHealsMe.com. We'd love to hear from you. Please do not take any information from Cannabis Heals Me or its guests as medical advice. Contact your licensed physician before taking cannabis or using it for medical treatments. 